I can switch side, which is great. Okay. Um, so sorry for the for the wait. Um, so this is a, a new talk. Uh, you 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 may have seen some of my uh, previous talks that you know that are available um, uh, in various places, um, but this is actually a, a somewhat new talk. So there's a, a bit of new material here, and I've been asking the question myself, the question for several years now, is uh, you know what would be the architecture of a autonomous AI system? So kind of uh, you know taking things from first principles. And then um, we are to the point where we have techniques that you know allows us to, you know, train systems to represent data. Uh, we have, uh, you know, a good knowledge of reinforcement learning and optimal control and various things like this. Is there a way to assemble all the pieces into a consistent uh, architecture that may uh, have the properties that of intelligence that we observe in uh, animals and, and humans? And so the first question that we might ask ourselves is, um, you know, how do um, you know, what, could machines learn learn like uh, humans and animals? And and the first thing that we uh, we observe is that uh, babies learn uh, uh, how the world works mostly by observation in the first few months of life. They they can't act very much in the world. They mostly observe, and simply by observing, they are accumulating an enormous amount of uh, uh, background knowledge about the world uh, in the form, I think, of uh, models of the world, predictive models of the world. Um, and, and so, you know, there, there are uh, concepts like, uh, very simple concepts like being able to distinguish uh, animate objects from inanimate objects, even learning what objects are, the fact that there are objects in front of others. Um, uh, the fact that when an object uh, hides another one, the, the one that's hidden is, you know, still exists, the notion of object permanence, which babies learn very early in the first two months of, uh, of life. Um, the fact that when you you put certain objects uh, on uh, on the table, for example, they will they will stay up and some of them will fall. Uh, the fact that uh, an object that will not be that is not supported will fall. So things like this, where um, you know it takes about nine months for babies to learn that uh, gravity has an effect on objects and that objects that are not supported will fall. Um, so if you show uh, a nine-month-old baby. Uh, the little scenario at the bottom left here, where you see a little uh, car, uh, you know, moving off a platform and, uh, you know, appearing to float in the air, uh, a nine-month baby will look very surprised and look at this for a long time because uh, her model of the world is being violated. But a six-month-old baby will not actually look at it very surprised because a six-month-old baby has not yet acquired the notion that objects that are not supported uh, will fall. And so what, you know, a big mystery is, uh, you know, how is it that with all the, the powerful techniques that we have, we cannot get a self-driving car to learn to drive itself, whereas, you know, any teenager can learn to drive a car in about 20 hours of uh, practice. And the difference is, uh, you know, the teenager has a pretty sophisticated model of the world uh, telling him that, uh, or her that, uh, you know, if you drive next to a cliff and you, you turn your wheel to the right, the, the car will run off the cliff and nothing good will, will happen. Um, whereas if you don't have a good model of the world, you, you will have to run off the cliff multiple times to realize it's a bad idea, right? So if you are in kind of a reinforcement learning scenario without uh, a model of the world, you'll have to run off the cliff thousands of times before you figure out that it's not a good idea and before you figure out how not to do it, okay? Um, so that's the... Um, you know, how do we get machines to do this? And I think it's one of the main challenges of, uh, of uh, AI today, uh, machine learning in particular, but AI more generally. Um, so one big question is, uh, how do we get uh, machines to learn uh, representations of the world, but also predictive models of the world? And this I will answer with uh, something, you know, with self-supervised learning, but also uh, other things I'll talk about. The second question is, how do we get machines to reason? Uh, so I was alluding to this in the, in the, in the questions at, at first, um, uh, uh, what does it really, uh, what does it mean to reason uh, when, you know, the system is supposed to be differentiable and, and, and everything and um, uh, how to do it in a way that's compatible with, uh, you know, backprop essentially or gradient-based uh, gradient -based learning. Uh, and then the third thing is how to learn to plan complex action sequences. And I, I don't have any complete answer to this, but I'll, I'll try to give some idea of how we might uh, approach that problem. Okay, so um, how do humans and animals learn so quickly? I learned, you know, I, I told you about the 
you know, what, uh, how baby can learn models of the world really quickly. It's not just babies, it's also animals um, and everything. And, you know, there were work, you know, classic work in, um, in, in psychology. This is a slide I, I stole from uh, my friend, Jintan Ramalik. Uh, uh, Craig in particular, Kenneth Craig in the 1940s, who, who basically, you know, said that uh, common sense in, uh, in humans is not, is not knowledge, but it's just, it's a collection of models, essentially. Um, okay, so I'm gonna jump right in and make a proposal for an arch architecture for autonomous AI system. Um, this is the kind of stuff that you can allow yourself to do when you uh, when you're a, you know a Turing Award winner, um, and and people you know there's there's a chance that people will not laugh at you, okay? Um, but you are welcome to laugh at me, all right? I I, I welcome uh, uh, harsh criticism. Okay, so here is a possible architecture. A possible architecture is composed of uh, I'll start with the world model. So the world model allows uh, the intelligent agent to predict what's going to happen before it happens, okay? Um, so the world model gets an idea of what the state of the world is, and that estimate of the state of the world is provided by the perception module, okay, that estimates the state of the world, which of course is incomplete. And then the world model allows the system to predict what's going to happen in the world, either because the world is evolving or because um, there's a sequence of actions that the agent wants to take, which will drive the, the world to a, a particular direction. Okay, then, um, then there is a, a cost module. So that cost uh, basically measures the degree of discomfort that uh, the agent um, uh, feels, if you want, or, or, or is in. So essentially the cost function takes the uh, predicted or actual state of the world and then compute uh, a cost um, that indicates to what extent the agent is unhappy, right? You can think of it this way. That cost is composed of two submodules, uh, one called an intrinsic cost, which is sort of a hardwired immutable module uh, that essentially uh, implements the, the basic drives of the system, right? So if you want to hardwire some behavior in the system, you don't program the behavior, you just design an objective function in such a way that when the system optimizes this objective function, it will actually uh, uh, have the behavior that you expect, okay? Um, so the fact that this is hardwired basically controls the, what, the, what the agent can do. And then there is a critic and the world of the critic is, is basically a trainable cost function whose function is to predict the future values of the intrinsic cost, um, if you want. So basically it gives the agent an idea of what's going to happen uh, of, of the potential positive or negative outcome of a particular situation uh, where the critic looks at a predicted state of the world and can tell the agent, this is gonna turn good or this is gonna turn bad, essentially. Um, now, uh, there are a couple other modules in there. Uh, one is the actor. So the role of the actor is to figure out what sequence of actions uh, can I take so that according to my prediction given by the world model and, and given the cost, I can take a sequence of actions that minimizes the cost. Okay, so if you know anything, anything about optimal control, think of this as model predictive control. You, you can predict what, uh, what the system you want to control is going to do using your model. You have a cost function that you want to minimize. And what you can do is figure out a sequence of actions that will minimize your cost according to your prediction. Uh, so that's the actor. The short-term memory, I'm not going to talk about it right now. And then there is this mysterious module on top of it called, a, on top of everything called a configurator which apparently has no input, but it takes input from every other module essentially. And what it does is that it configures all of the other modules for a particular task at hand. So think of the world model as not being a completely generic world model, but a, a world model you can configure um, to be appropriate for a particular situation that you're encountering or problem you're trying to solve. Um, and, uh, and that configurator basically uh, primes the perception system to kind of detect the right things, extract the right information from the environment, primes the world model to do the right predictions that are relevant for the task, and then configures the cost function uh, to kind of achieve a sub goal that it thinks is, uh, is appropriate. So it's kind of a, a bit of a, a director, like a, you know, a music director kind of thing. Um, uh, and I must tell you right now that I don't know how to build a configurator, but the rest, um, I have some idea. Okay, so there's several ways in which an agent like this can decide to act or not. Um, so one is uh, uh, something I call mode one. This is by analogy to Daniel Kahneman's uh, system one, essentially, 
which consists in just you know getting a preset from the world, running through the perception system, which extracts which extracts a, a representation of the state of the world uh, uh, called S zero here, um, and then that goes into um, a, a module. Uh, you can call it a policy module, uh, and that policy module directly produces an action that goes into the world. Okay. Um, so that's kind of reactive policy. Uh, it's the kind of things that you know humans and animals do subconsciously without thinking about it. Um, now, simultaneously with this, you can the system can use its world model to also predict what would have happened uh, and what the cost would have been um, uh, according to its own world model, and then store the result in its short-term memory for future reference because it needs that to be able to train its its uh, critic and to train its world model as well. Um, so that's relatively simple. And now there is uh, mode two. So mode two is akin to uh, what's called uh, model predictive control in optimal control. Um, so it's a perception planning action cycle where uh, the system kind of makes uh, you know, a preset um, uh, X that goes into uh, the perceptual module called the encoder here uh, that makes an estimate about the state of the world. And then you run your world model for multiple time steps. Um, and the actor proposes an initial sequence of actions to take. Uh, the cost function computes the cost, and then by some uh, mechanism, possibly gradient based, possibly other, um, the actor optimizes the imagined sequence of actions uh, so as to minimize the cost according to the prediction made by the by the model. Okay, so this is classic uh, model predictive control. People in robotics and optimal control use this all the time. Um, and then once you've done this uh, this planning you send the first action or the first few actions to the effectors uh, in the world, okay? Nothing uh, particularly new about this, except the fact that we're going to learn the world model. Um, uh, let me skip this one out. Okay, so um, as I said, there is a, a cost module that's composed of two sub modules. One is the intrinsic cost. The intrinsic cost is composed of multiple sub modules, each of which is engineered to uh, drive the system towards um, achieving particular uh, uh, tasks or, or guaranteeing certain conditions. Okay, the battery is low, the system has to go um, uh, you know, find a, a plug to recharge its batteries, um, uh, you know, things like that, right? Um, and then the, the trainable part of it, the, the, the critic, which basically using the short-term memory can recover traces of previous states and future cost and kind of train itself to predict future costs from uh, from current states. Um, so this is actually done uh, this way. You can have uh, the short-term memory that whenever the agent uh, acts in the world, it stores triplets of uh, the, the the state uh, or the representation of the state together with the intrinsic cost that was associated with it together with a timestamp or something like this. Uh, and then what you can do is recover a past uh, uh, state together with a, uh, a, a future um, uh, intrinsic cost and then train the critic to, pre to predict the future value of the intrinsic cost from the past value of the state, okay? So if you have some sort of buffer uh, to remember the sequence of the states, you can, you can train the critic. Of course, you can train the critic to not just predict one future intrinsic cost, but some combination of future uh, future cost. In reinforcement learning, people use exponentially weighted uh, future costs, but you don't have to do that. Um, okay, so we come to the crux of the question is how do we build and train the world model? And this is really kind of the, the centerpiece of, uh, of the talk here. So the main issue there is that the world is stochastic. So if I have, let's say, a neural net that I train to make a prediction for what's going to happen in the world, um, uh, even if it's a, pro a probabilistic prediction, um, you know, it, it's going to have to make one prediction. And, uh, and if, if I train it with something like least squared error, uh, uh, mean squared error, the, the system will basically have to predict the average of all the possible outcomes that can happen in the world. So if I do this experiment where I put a pen on the table and I let it go, the pen, every time I repeat the experiment, might fall in a different direction. And the prediction that my system will provide is, uh, you know, basically a kind of transparent version of the pen in all possible orientations, which of course is not a good prediction, right? So we'd like the system to be able to make uh, sharp predictions, but different predictions depending on things you cannot predict, um, which could be a latent variable. One way to handle this, um, um, and so, so here's an example, for uh, example, if you train a system with least square 
to make a, a, a to do video prediction. Uh, you get this this kind of prediction you observe here at the top of the little girl when she kind of moves to uh, blow on uh, uh, the candles. Um, the prediction becomes blurry. Those are predictions made by a large convolutional net trained on video, and because it has to predict the average of all the possible outcomes, it makes a blurry prediction. Uh, let me actually repeat this uh, video. Um, so there are techniques with latent variable techniques. So uh, this is an example of what you see at the bottom. These are predictions for trajectories of cars on the highway. And uh, you see those blurry in the, in the second column from the left, uh, very blurry prediction. This is uh, essentially a, a large convolutional net that predicts the next, uh, uh, the next frame. Um, okay. if, if you add latent variables to your system, um, uh, so basically variables that you sample um, in, inside of your system, your system can make multiple predictions, but it's still very difficult to actually make uh, uh, multiple predictions. So um, that's, the, that's the, 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 the problem that self-supervised learning faces. Uh, there are multiple possible prediction, you know, continuations of a video, uh, multiple things that can happen, and how do you deal with that uh, uncertainty? And so the immediate reaction, uh, you know, if you are brought up in a kind of a, a normal university, is to say, well, you know, don't predict a single point, pre predict a distribution. The problem is that we know how to predict distributions for discrete things like, like words in a text. We don't know how to represent distributions for high dimensional continuous things like images. Um, and so we, um, so I'm ready to abandon the idea that we need to make probabilistic predictions, okay? And I'll, I'll, I'll try to convince you of this. Um, so th this, uh, but there is this idea that by training a system to make, uh, um, to basically capture the dependency between, let's say, the past of a video and the future of it, that system might, might learn a lot of basic knowledge about the world. Uh, the fact that, you know, the world is three-dimensional, that there are objects, that objects, you know, might be at different distances, that objects are animate or inanimate, that objects obey gravity and intuitive physics, and, and, and that, you know, animate objects uh, behave in certain ways. And so you can, you can sort of imagine a system that would build uh, concepts like this by sort of training itself to to make more and more uh, uh, long-term predictions uh, in video. Um, but the way to handle this, I think, is this idea of energy-based models, which I've been trying to advocate for quite a long time. Uh, it's basically the idea that you do not uh, parameterize a predictor to predict a, a y from an x. Okay, You observe an x, for example, a, a video clip, and you train it to predict y. Um, you can only make one prediction. So what I'm going to use instead is uh, one of those energy-based models. So basically, it's an energy function. It produces a scalar energy. And what it tells you is whether the x and the y that you propose to it are compatible. Is y a good continuation for uh, x, uh, x being a, a video clip? OK? And there might, of course, be multiple y's that are compatible with a given x. OK? So I kind of represented this uh, symbolically here on the right, where you have a uh, two uh, scalar variable x and y, and the, the the black dots are data points. Okay, so obviously there is a strong dependency between x and y, but it's not like there is a function that maps x to y. It's more like a complicated dependency for any value of x. There might be multiple values of y, perhaps an infinity of values of y that are compatible with it. So the way I want to capture the dependency is through an energy function, which will take low values on the data points and higher values outside. And that's kind of symbolized by those kind of, uh, uh, you know, level curves, if you want, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this diagram here. Okay, so we get regions of low energies that basically are around the regions of high data density. And then outside of those regions, the energy goes up. Okay, that's an ideal energy-based model. And a big question is going to be, how do we train a system like this? Okay, how do we build it and how do we train it? What architecture do we give it? Um, so we can use an energy-based model to do prediction, but not in every case. But the way we do it is basically by finding a y, of which there might be multiple, that minimizes the energy function for a given x. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Let me skip this. You can turn an energy-based model into a probabilistic model in certain cases where the energy has a right property, uh, using, for example, a Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution. But I'm not going to insist that we do this. In fact, I'm going to insist that we don't do this. Um, okay, so um, there are uh, a particular type of energy-based models that are particularly interesting, and there are energy-based models that have latent variables in them, uh, which are called latent variable EBMs. 
Um, and the latent variable EBM is basically, again, an energy function that now depends on three variables, not just the X and Y that you provide to it, but also a Z that you do not provide. And what the system will have to do is uh, basically minimize the energy with respect to Z. So find the Z that minimizes the energy for a given uh, pair X, Y. And then the energy you get by minimizing here uh, with respect to Z, you call that F of X, Y. Okay, now Z is eliminated by this minimization. So think of this as inference and think of Z as capturing the information that is necessary to predict uh, uh, the compatibility between X and Y that is not present in X, uh, uh, might be present in Y, but it's basically not present in, uh, in any of the two, okay? So think, uh, for example, imagine that uh, X is a view of a scene, um, and then Y is a different view of the same scene. I've moved the camera, and now I have a different view of the same scene. How can I be sure that there are different views of the same scene and they are not views of different scenes? Um, if I knew what the transformation parameters were from the first view to the second view, um, I would be able to establish that those are probably two views of the same scene, right? So it would be useful to, to know that transformation and I can view this as uh, basically a set of latent variables, okay? Um, let's say X is uh, a short video of uh, uh, a car I'm following, okay, on the, on the road, and then the video stops, and, and Y is uh, a, a follow-up of that video, and the, the car was coming on the fork in the road. There was the kind of two road it could, it could take, so the car could go left or go right. Um, uh, if Y happens to be the situation where the, the car in front of me goes, goes right, uh, uh, then the Z variable would take, you know, one particular value, and if it goes to the left, it would take another value, and I cannot predict in advance uh, whether the car is going to go to the left or to the right, but um, if it has decided, you know, I can um, I can assign a value to the latent variable to figure out what is the best explanation for this y given this x. Okay, now uh, how do we train an energy-based model? Uh, and that's that's really where things start to become interesting. Uh, there's basically two classes of methods, and anything you've 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 um, uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me if you have a question. I'm not sure this is a question or not, but I'm hearing. Oh, okay. Uh, so I actually have that. a quick question, if you yeah. allow. Yes. Um, Belha, you have a question? Yeah, please. So I have this. Um, Growing feeling that uh, model parameters are seen as a constraint uh, in deep learning to uh, make a model fit the data. And I would like to have your thoughts on um, uh, this idea of making model parameters irrelevant. Um, so an example of this is basically the EBM you're showing, where uh, uh, none of the slides you showed uh, showed a, um, a, a model parameter. It's only about fitting uh, the data using a, a some potential distribution. Or another example is, uh, is the Bayesian view where you don't assign a scalar to the weights, but you assign a random distribution. So yeah, I would like to have your thoughts on making uh, model parameters irrelevant in the future or not, um, yeah. Um, I don't think we can make them irrelevant, frankly, but because, um, uh, because of you know, intractabilities that come with sort of full Bayesian approaches where you, you have distribution over parameters instead of uh, actual parameters. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I like the idea in principle, but, you know, in practice, um, uh, you can only use it in kind of, you know, certain cases. But I haven't really talked about training yet. I mean, that's just what I'm, I'm coming to. And uh, uh, basically all the methods that uh, you've, you've ever heard fall into one of those two categories I'm going to talk about, okay? Um, that's true, thank you. Um, so, uh, so there are two ways to train an energy-based model. And this also applies to probabilistic models, by the way. Uh, the first way is contrastive methods. And the second way is regularized methods. So contrastive methods consist in, uh, let's imagine uh, here in this little diagram, you have a low energy region uh, symbolized by this sort of pinkish uh, region here. And you have a bunch of data points, which are those, those kind of blue dots. Uh, so right now, the uh, region of low energy, think of it as kind of a level set of the energy function. Uh, is not very good because um, it's got regions of low energy that don't have any data points in them. And it's got a bunch of data points that don't 
are not given low energy. So it's not a very good model. So we're going to apply some uh, learning procedure to it. And what we want in the end is that, you know, we want to push down the energy in regions where we have points. And we want to make sure that the energy, energy is higher in regions where we don't have points. And so contrastive methods do this by basically hallucinating a bunch of those green points. Uh, and those green points are contrastive samples whose energy we're going to push up. Okay. So we're going to take uh, a blue point, push down its energy by changing the parameters of our energy function, and then take a green point and push its energy up. Okay. Um, and this is a perfectly good method. And you know, basically uh, every powerful probabilistic method you ever heard of does that. Okay. It pushes down the energy of stuff you want, pushes up the energy of stuff you don't want. Um, and it has to do this because you know distributions are normalized. So uh, if you give high probability to something, you have to give low probability to something else. Um, uh, and the problem with this approach is that in a high dimensional space, if your energy function is very flexible, the number of points that you're going to have to, whose energy you're going to have to pull up, will grow exponentially with the dimension of the space. And so. If you have a generative model, or if you, even if you don't have a generative model, but you have an energy model that uh, uh, you know has a high dimension in its uh, sort of internal representation, if you want, uh, you know you might need a very very large number of contrastive samples to make sure that uh, the energy function takes the right shape. And I think those methods are doomed because of that. Okay. Uh, it's very sad because most of the methods that we know about today in machine learning are contrastive. But I think ultimately for self-supervised or unsupervised learning, those methods are doomed. Um, they're not going to scale up, essentially. So consider the alternative. The alternative is, can you come up with a regularizer that will cause the energy function to only want to give low energy to a small part of the space? the space of Ys in particular. Okay, so can you come up with some way, uh, some term in a cost function somewhere, energy or something like that, uh, that will cause your energy function to uh, basically shrink wrap the data, the region of high data density by applying a force that kind of brings the boundary of the low energy region uh, closer to the data point if you want, okay? And I'm going to be advocating for this. Okay, so contrastive methods, uh, uh, you know, basically the, the, the only thing you need to do there is come up with some loss function that, you know, is a, a uh, 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 you know, increasing function of the energy of data points and a decreasing function of the energy of contrastive points. And then you need a way of generating contrastive points. And basically all the methods that uh, in machine learning that people have come up with, you know, most of them, a very large majority of them, uh, differ by the loss fun the precise form of the loss function they use and how they pick the contrastive samples. Okay. Now there are methods that are regularized. And in fact, uh, I have a big chart here that indicates to what extent uh, methods that you've heard about are contrastive or non-contrastive. Every maximum likelihood method that uses Monte Carlo or Marco chain Monte Carlo sampling is a contrastive method. Contrastive divergence is a contrastive method. It even has that in the name. Uh, Classical metric learning or Siamese networks are contrastive methods. Um, uh, you know, noise contrastive estimation, minimum probability flow, or probability flow maybe not. Um, uh, GANs are contrastive methods, um, strange uh, types. Masked autoencoders and denoising autoencoders are also contrastive methods. So basically, a lot of the models that people use today in, in uh, machine learning and AI are, are contrastive methods. And I tell you, they're doomed. Okay, that sounds uh, weird because they all work, we know. But uh, for the type of problems I'm interested in, which is uh, capturing dependencies in high dimensional continuous spaces, um, I don't think they're viable. Um, so regularized method, we already have a bunch of them. Um, perhaps the uh, easiest one to, to think about is things like, uh, like VAE, okay? VAE is essentially a, a regularized method uh, for uh, energy-based models. These other methods like contracting autoencoders and and you know and, and things like uh, Barlow twins and Vicrag, which I which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, there's a whole bunch of different loss functions you can use for contrastive methods, but I'm not going to go through them because, as I told you, I don't believe in contrastive methods anymore. Even though I was kind of uh, co-author of some of the early papers on this, um, and you know you, you probably heard of this thing called InfoNCE, which is very popular at the moment for 
training joint embedding architectures for image recognition. And um, uh, I think five years from now, nobody will talk about this anymore. Um, uh, this is to say that GANs and probabilistic methods are contrastive, but I'm going I'm to skip this. And I also mentioned that denoising autoencoders and uh, you know, BERT style masked autoencoders are also uh, contrastive methods. Um, but OK, let's, uh, let's jump into what I think are the most promising architectures and the most promising ways to train them. And so the most promising architecture, I believe, uh, is uh, uh, a joint embedding uh, predictive architecture. Um, so basically, it works like this. The joint, joint embedding predictive architecture, or JEPA, um, it, has, it takes those two inputs, x, x and y, that you're trying to capture the dependencies uh, uh, of. It runs both of them through encoders. They don't, they don't have to be the same. They could be different encoders. In fact, x, or, x and y don't even have to be uh, like the same modality. You know, one can be video, the other one audio, if you want. Um, and then what you're going to try to do is uh, train the system in such a way that the, the representation for, for y, called sy, is easily predictable from the representation of x called sx, OK? So it, there's going to be a trainable predictor, which may or may not have a latent variable. And what the, the role of this predictor is to predict SX, sy from sx, OK? So the big characteristic of this architecture is that it's not a generative architecture because we don't have a model that predicts y. We have a model that predicts the representation of y, sy. That's very important because it allows the model to ignore irrelevant details about Y that you don't care about for your task. Okay, so the encoder for Y may have some invariance properties that will let it abandon all kinds of irrelevant information about Y that you don't want to force your predictor to predict. Okay, so let's say I'm driving uh, on the street, um, on a road, okay. And there are things I care about, like the position of other cars, you know, things like that, right? And, and pedestrians and everything. But I really don't care about the, the, the trees that are bordering the, the, the road, uh, which have, you know, beautiful leaves that are moving in the wind. There's an enormous amount of information in there, you know, incredibly detailed. And if I wanted to use a generative model, I would have to predict every single leaf in every single one of those trees if I want to minimize my prediction error. Um, with a model like this, where I, I encode y, I can my encoder can choose to just ignore this completely, not even look at the trees, or maybe look at the trunks because I don't want I don't want to run into them, uh, but not attempt to predict things that are just too complicated to predict, not attempt to predict things that I know are useless to predict. Okay, so that's the architecture I'm going to try to sell to you. All right, uh, and you know as I said during the mysteriously during the the question uh, the, the session initially. Uh, this is not a generative model because it's not attempting to predict y. As a consequence, it does not, uh, it cannot be converted into a probabilistic model. This model cannot be turned into a probabilistic model on y simply because the encoder may have invariances, which makes it so that uh, by taking the exponential minus the energy and normalizing it, I cannot normalize it. Okay. My, the, the integral will, will diverge, essentially. Or, I mean, it will certainly be intractable, but it will also diverge. So I abandon the idea of being able to predict y, um, but I preserve the idea of being able to capture the uh, relevant dependencies between x and y, and I abandon the idea of doing probabilistic modeling. Okay? It's a lot to swallow, okay? because the religion in machine learning is you, know, you should uh, learn probabilistic models and generative models are the best thing since sliced bread. And so I'm telling you to drop both of them. And uh, I might understand you might be a little reluctant. Um, but I have, um, you know, I, I think convincing argument that may or may not convince you. So, um, uh, so how are we going to, uh, so we can train those with contrastive methods. But again, I'm going to argue against them. So I'm going to flip through a whole bunch of slides that talk about contrastive methods for joint embedding architectures. And the reason I have those slides is because those things actually work if the representation of the, the things you're trying to train is not too large. So uh, a good example of this is Siamese networks. And uh, you know I had the, some of the original papers on this going back to the early 90s, where you show two uh, uh, inputs to a system that you know are semantically identical, perhaps different views of the same image. 
and you run them through uh, uh, two copies of the same neural net, and you train the system to produce the same output. Okay, so here you don't have a predictor. The predictor is basically the identity function, but it's basically a joint embedding architecture. And because it's contrastive, you have to come up with uh, contrastive samples, uh, which are you know basically pairs of images that you know are different. And what you're going to have to do is push away the two representations uh, from each other, so that you make sure that you know the system does not uh, collapse. Essentially, does not uh, basically ignore the input and produces constant vectors on the output. And so this contrastive phase prevents the system from collapsing. Okay, prevent the systems from basically having a flat energy surface that gives zero energy or constant energy to every pair of xy. You force it to give low energy to stuff, you know, good pairs and high energy to bad pairs. Um, and a lot of people have, you know, come up with lots of really kind of uh, ingenious uh, algorithm for doing this. Cynthia and Simclear, Suave, Obo. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, you know, and they appear um, every day. Uh, and then, you know, you, you train the system to learn a representation, then you chop off the last layer, you plug a classifier on it, and you see how well the classifier performs, and that's the way you test those systems. Uh, so it's, you know, it's somewhat uh, successful. In fact, it's kind of uh, produced a, a wave of interest in, in, uh, in, uh, in things like that um, uh, uh, in the last two years or so in, in computer vision. Um, but uh, and it works for all kinds of stuff. It works for speech recognition really well. It works for, you know, translation. It works for all kinds of stuff. But I, re I really want to talk about regularized methods for joint embedding architectures. This is really the cool stuff, in my opinion. Um, so here is the basic idea of, of how you train one of those uh, JEPAs uh, using the regularized method. So essentially, you have three cost functions, OK? Three terms in your cost function. Um, uh, the first one says, I want to maximize the information content that SX has about X. Okay, and the reason I want this is because I want to prevent SX from being constant or uninformative about X. So I want to maximize the information that SX provides about X, okay, in some way. Now I need to define exactly how I'm going to do this, okay, but I'll come to, to this in a minute and it, it will have to be some approximation. But the principle is that you want to maximize the information content that uh, SX has about X. Similarly, you want to maximize the information content that SY has about Y, okay? Now, if that were the only criterion, it would be trivial. Uh, you could just set SX to X and SY to Y, and that would be the end of it. But there is another criterion, and the other criterion is the prediction error. So you want to be able to have a predictor here that you're going to train in such a way that the, prediction, that the uh, representation for Y is easily predictable from the representation from X. And this is where the system may choose to abandon unpredictable details like the moving leaves of the trees, okay? It will say, okay, I could keep all this information in SY, but if I do, I'm not gonna be able to predict, uh, to do a good job at predicting if that information is present in SY because it's basically random. It's like, you know, ripples on the pond or, or things like that. You know, I, I will have a very hard time predicting sort of random uh, things that can happen. So, um, I'm going to train my encoder so that uh, the encoder drops that information from SY uh, in such a way that now SY becomes easily predictable from SX. Okay, so it's going to be a trade off between keeping as much information in SX and SY as possible, but also making SY predictable from SX. All right. Now, of course, you know, the world being uh, somewhat unpredictable, you may need to have the help of a latent variable that basically contains all the stuff you don't know about the world. Um, that you may still need to be able to uh, capture, but that you, you can't extract from, uh, from X. So the Z variable basically says, what amount of information do I need to complement SX so that I can predict XY? Okay, that's what the role of Z is. And of course, you want to minimize the information content of Z because if you don't do that, then Z might just completely take over. Z might contain all the information there is to um, to know about SY and your system will collapse in another way or will just not look at SX at all and then just put the, all the information about SY in Z. So what you have to do is push down on the information content of Z, make it as little informative as possible, okay? Through perhaps a regularizer. Okay, so we have four terms really in our uh, objective function that we're gonna use for training. 
one maximizes the information content of Sx, the other one maximizes the information content of Sy, one is minimize the prediction error, and another one is minimizing information content of the latent variable. Okay. How are we going to instantiate this to something that actually works? Okay, so uh, one algorithm I'm going to uh, describe in particular is uh, this thing called VicReg. This means variance, invariance, covariance, regularization. Um, but there, there is a number of uh, uh, algorithms that, that do things that are sort of similar to, uh, I mean, that can be applied to this sort of joint embedding uh, architecture, although not necessarily the predictive version of it. So one is called BYOL that came out of DeepMind um, a while back. Um, and it's not completely obvious that it actually is an, uh, an instance of what I just talked about, um, but it's kind of sort of seems to do, be doing something similar. Uh, another one is um, this thing called WMSE, which I'm not going to talk about. Another one is Barlow Twins, which came out of my group at, uh, at FAIR, um, but had a, a few quirks. And then VicRag is basically a version of Barlow Twins that uh, has those quirks uh, fixed. So let me talk about this uh, idea of Barlow Twin. Um, this uh, has been on archive for a while, but it's going to be a uh, ICLEA 2022 paper. Uh, and it's, you know, as I said, an improvement of Barlow Twins. So basically the idea there is how do you measure the information content of the representation of X, let's say. Okay, so the first thing you want is, is that you want every variable of SX to not be constant. You want it to change uh, for, to be different for uh, a different uh, training sample, right? So take every component in the vector SX and make sure that the variance of that component over a batch is above a certain threshold, let's say one, okay? Uh, when I say variance, it's actually standard deviation uh, for technical reasons. Um, so you do this for every component of SX and you do this for every component of SY, okay? And that will prevent the system from cheating by just making SX and XY constant. But the system can still cheat, it can, uh, make uh, all the components of SX very highly correlated with each other or very dependent on each other, which will reduce the information content uh, contained in SX. So what we're gonna do here is that we're going to um, map the SX vector to a higher dimensional vector through a neural net with a couple layers, okay? And we're, what we're gonna to do to those uh, things is that we're going to decorrelate the, the values, uh, uh, the output values of that neural net with many outputs, okay? Um, so um, let me back up actually. Let me, let me not talk about the expander. Let me just talk about the, um, those SX variables. So one way yeah. to prevent all the variables from doing the same thing is to decorrelate them, okay? So I can uh, compute the covariance matrix of, uh, of, of the SX vectors over a batch, and then make sure the off diagonal terms uh, of that covariance matrix are close to zero, okay? I can put this in a cost function, it's differentiable, no problem. The problem with this, of course, is that those variables may end up being decorrelated, but not independent. I really want them to be independent, uh, or at least have some level of independence. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna map all of those variables to a, a number of uh, initially random nonlinear functions using a neural net, you say, okay? So I'm gonna use a neural net with a number of uh, random weights uh, that is going to map this uh, SX vector to a higher dimensional vector, okay? And I'm going to decorrelate those variables. And because they are nonlinear functions of the original variables, it's gonna have the effect of making the original variables more independent of each other if you want. In fact, I'm, I'm going to train this neural net as well so that uh, it extracts you know, as much information as possible from, the, uh, from SX so that uh, you know, the, the components of SX are kind of made as independent as possible, right? Okay, so that's the first criterion. So the criterion for maximizing the information content of SX and SY is a combination of two things. Uh, take your SX vector, map it to a higher dimensional uh, vector, through a trainable uh, neural net with a few layers, uh, maintain the variance or the standard deviation of each of the variables above a certain threshold, and then decorrelate all of those variables. And this will cause uh, the components of SX to uh, basically be informative and uh, somewhat independent, okay? So you've kind of uh, maintained the information content of uh, both SX and SY. 
uh, the second term is going to be simply, you know, I have a predictor, I want to minimize the prediction error. Now, in simple implementations of, of VCRAG that are used for image recognition, there is no predictor. It's just, you're just trying to make SX and XY equal. So think of it as a predictor that's equal to the identity function, okay? Um, and in fact, if you do this, uh, so if you, you take, for example, images from ImageNet, you augment those images by distorting them. You show two distorted versions of the same image to the, to the, the system, and it has two uh, convolutional net, basically they share the weights, but they don't have to, but you can make them share the weights. Um, you, you run those two images to the, the two convolutional nets and you apply the VCRAG criterion on the output, maintain the information content of uh, SX and XY, but at the same time make, make SX and XY as equal to each other as possible, as close to each other as possible. So you do that for pre-training, then you take uh, SX, let's say, and you freeze the network and you train a classifier and see how uh, train it supervised on ImageNet and see how well it performs. And uh, VCRAG performs as well as all the other self-supervised running techniques that people have tried in the same conditions, okay? So it works the same as everything else, but the big advantage is it's non-contrastive. It's not limited to a low dimensional representation. You can use very large dimensional representation. Uh, you don't need to uh, scrap for contrastive samples and have smart ways of doing uh, negative mining. You don't need to share the weights between the two, uh, the two paths uh, at all. Uh, you don't even need the two paths to have the same architecture. They can be completely different. The two inputs might, come, might take uh, different uh, modalities of, of inputs. Uh, so, um, you know, very uh, general and powerful and it works just as well as uh, uh, other methods. Um, I mean, there's kind of various results that I'm not gonna bore you with. Um, it kind of works, but um, but it has this big advantage that you know it doesn't need uh, things like batch norm to work. It doesn't need um, you know things like uh, uh, an extra like a stop gradient or or exponential moving average or all the tricks that people use to get those things to work. It doesn't need any of that. Um, and in fact, it helps the other techniques if you if you use it as well. Okay, um, so the next thing is. Um, you know, I, I told you about an architecture for an intelligent agent, which I have not built, okay, I must tell you. Uh, but uh, I think the, this idea of sort of uh, the JPA architecture is gonna be a good one for uh, learning world models. Um, and I think the reason it's gonna be a good one is, is the following. Um, so there's been some work, uh, some, of which, some of which is mine, but there's a lot of work in, in robotics uh, and machine learning in uh, uh, predictive models that try to predict what's gonna happen in the world, um, but basically predicting in pixel space, okay? So basically doing video prediction. And um, I've argued here, I changed my mind about this, you know, over the last two, two years. Um, the argument I, I just gave is that we should not try to predict pixels. I used to be adamant about the fact that we should, and I completely changed my mind about this. So things like variational autoencoders predict pixels, right? Any kind of generative model predicts pixels. GANs predict, uh, predict pixels. Um, uh, VQVAE predict pixels. I mean, they predict the stuff that you want to predict. What I'm arguing for is do a joint embedding. So don't try to predict everything. Um, but you know, there are si simple situations where, you know, if you have something like, you know, equivalent to a VAE or something like this, and you're trying to do multiple predictions by sampling a latent variable in different ways, it actually works. This is an example for, uh, you know, a self-driving car kind of application where the, the four columns you see on the, on, the, on the right are predictions produced by something that is basically akin to a, a variational autoencoders for which you sample the latent variable in different ways and you get different outcomes from those different sampling. Uh, whereas if you don't have a latent variable, um, you, you get those blurry predictions, okay? So you can do something with generative models as long as what you're predicting is not too complicated. Um, and uh, okay, and this you know this sort of works more or less uh, more or less reliably if if you use uh, this way of kind of you know inferring actions uh, um, as a way to train a policy essentially. But uh, but really what I want to talk about now is um, how you're going to use those JEPAs to build world models that uh, can be used for prediction and planning. Uh, 
Uh, and again, this is not something I've implemented. This is more like a, a research plan, if you want. So I'm, I'm telling you all my secret of what I'm going to work on for the next few years. All right. Um, and the one idea is hierarchical JEPA. So hierarchical JEPA goes, goes like this. Because a JEPA learns abstract representations within which it can do prediction, we have the option of stacking multiple layers of a JEPA. So basically, take the representation learned by uh, you know, a, sing, a, a simple JEPA that does, let's say, short-term predictions. OK, so it predicts x1 from x0. But let's say we want to do long-term prediction. If we want to be able to do long-term prediction, we probably have to do this prediction in a more abstract space where even less uh, details are, are being encoded by the representations. And I can do this by basically stacking another layer of JEPA on top of the first layer so that I have a second encoder that's going to you know, further encode the representation of X into a more abstract one in which there is less information about X. Uh, but with that more abstract representation, I might be able to make a longer term prediction. Okay. So, you know, if I want to predict, um, you know, I'm, I want to, you know, I'm in New York City, so I, I won't take the car, but if I wanted to take my car and drive to, uh, I don't know, Princeton to visit uh, Sanjeev, um, uh, you know, I can predict more or less at a high level what route I have to follow, approximately how long it's going to take. But I can't know all the details of which, uh, you know, which traffic light are going to be uh, happening to be red, what truck am, am I going to be stuck when behind uh, on route one, or whatever, right? I cannot predict details, but there is some level of abstraction in which I can make a reasonably good prediction in the long in the long run. Okay, some sort of qualitative prediction because I have this abstract representation of the, you know, of the state of the of the world and the 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 chain of events that might might occur, all right? And so JEPA has this property that, you know, you might be able to have higher and higher level of abstractions in your representations, which would allow you to make longer and longer term predictions. And that's really important if you want to be able to do hierarchical planning. If you want to plan, if I want to plan to go to uh, Princeton from, uh, uh, from New York, um, you know, I have to uh, go to the parking garage and pick up my car and then, you know, drive the car through Holland Tunnel, and then you know, uh, take the uh, you know New Jersey Turnpike or whatever, blah blah blah, right? So I can describe to you what sequence of uh, uh, actions I have to take. They're not really actions; they're more like descriptions of a particular conditions of the state of the world at various times. Okay, and now I can decompose the first task into a smaller number of tasks, right? So to get to the parking garage, I have to get out of my uh, apartment and you know walk to the parking garage. To get out of my apartment, I have to stand up. Run, to, go to the door, open the door, uh, you know, run down the the stairs, you know, things like that, right? And then all the way down to millisecond by millisecond muscle control, which of course I don't need to instantiate from the start. You know, they will be instantiated as I go when I encounter obstacles I need to avoid and things like that. So, you know, how are we going to do this hierarchical planning? I tell you, the, there is no um, existing system that can do hierarchical planning particularly well today or at least not unless the intermediate concepts in this planning have been uh, uh, hardwired handcrafted. But that's the, that's the idea, that's the, the long-term plan for how a system like this would, would run. So it would have one of those hierarchical JEPAs, you know, two encoders that you know, take X and uh, extract a low-level representation as zero, and then a high-level representation as two of zero, okay, um, by st uh, stacking the two encoders. And then you start making a prediction at a high level. So you have a, a high level world model that does long-term prediction, uh, very coarse grained, um, you know, kind of like, you know, I'm gonna take my car, drive through, through Holland Tunnel and then, you know, take the uh, New Jersey Turnpike or whatever. Um, that's kind of a high level description. Uh, the goal ultimately being, you know, am I near Princeton? And the planning at that level is going to find a sequence of high level actions, which are not really actions, they're more like conditions that uh, think of them as sub goals, conditions that the, the state of the world has to satisfy for, you know, for, for, for me to go to the next step, okay? So, you know, am I in Holland Tunnel, right? So going to Holland Tunnel is, um, you know, being in Holland Tunnel is basically this uh, A2 of two, 
okay, would be kind of the first action. It would be more like a condition uh, on the world. Um, and then, you know, A24 would be, you know, exit the uh, New Jersey Turnpike at the right exit, you know, to get to Princeton or something. Um, so, okay, so my high level task has been decomposed into uh, sub goals, essentially. You can think of them as sub goals. And now I have the level below, which now is going to use a finer grain prediction uh, to figure out like what sequence of actions do I have to take now to satisfy this first, uh, this first condition. I don't have to run it for the entire segment. I just have to run it to the first condition. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, I can kind of keep doing this all the way down to, as I said, millisecond by millisecond muscle controls. So that, that's a sort of a conceptual idea of how to do hierarchical planning uh, with trainable world models whose architecture is one of those hierarchical jetas. Okay, this all kind of fits if you want. But again, I have to tell you, I have not implemented this. And so there's a lot of problems to solve to actually make this work and it might actually not work. Okay, but, um, but that's kind of the idea. Now, of course, we, we have to be able to handle uncertainty in those predictions. You know, am I going to take the, the, the New Jersey Turnpike or am I, going to, am I going to take route one or, you know, whatever other alternative route I can take to go to, uh, to Princeton? Um, uh, for that, I need to have latent variables that, uh, you know, which are part of the JEPA architecture that will allow me to basically explore multiple outcomes depending on the value of those, those latent variables, multiple outcomes might be predicted. Uh, and, uh, and I might be able to do sort of better planning that takes into account the sort of multiplicity of uh, uh, plausible futures uh, given the multiple values of the latent variable, right? Um, uh, you know, again, precisely how to do this um, may be expensive and not completely obvious, but uh, at least there is sort of a, a path to, uh, towards that. Now, you know, if you imagine a situation like this when you're playing a game, like, you know, what, what Ken was talking about, where, you know, the uh, the opponent is uh, uh, trying to get you, then the, you have to assume that a latent variable is going to be maximally annoying to you. Is going, you know, you're going to pick the latent variable that maximizes your cost, essentially. Uh, if the latent variable is a move that someone can make on, on a chessboard or a go board, uh, you, know, you can figure out what, uh, what move the opponent can take that will kind of maximize my cost. Uh, and then you can do the opposite for your for your game. So you know things that people do in the context of games is sort of integrated in this, except that in this model, I'm sort of counting on the fact that the cost, the predictor, uh, and everything else is differentiable. And uh, you know it's not the case when you have a go board that all the moves are differentiable. Maybe there's some abstract representation of it that is. Uh, differentiable, but the world itself is not differentiable. Okay, so basically, you think of the world model and the cost as a way of making the world differentiable. Okay, now notice that I haven't said a single word about reinforcement learning here, because everything I mentioned essentially has nothing to do with reinforcement learning. It has to do with optimal control, because my costs are differentiable and there are intrinsic costs. I can backpropagate gradient to them. And so I can minimize them with respect to actions or with respect to policies or parameters of some neural nets that computes a policy uh, without resorting to uh, uh, external rewards. In fact, you can think of the rewards here as being computed directly by the machine itself. The, the um, intrinsic cost function basically computes an intrinsic reward, okay? But it's differentiable. So whenever you take an action and the cost that you incur is uh, immediate, it's, it's because you, know, you, you, you do a, percep a perception and someone just pinched you. And so it hurts, right? So your cost, your intrinsic cost now is gonna light up uh, because someone just pinched you that you didn't predict. You don't have a way to backpropagate through your actions and change because you would have to backpropagate through the world, right? Uh, but what you can do is store that state and store the the uh, resulting intrinsic cost in your associative memory. Um, and then later, uh, train your critic uh, to predict that intrinsic cost 
given the state and the actions that you took before that happened. Okay. Um, and of course, you know, people do this in reinforcement learning as well. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying there's you know, anything wrong with this, but, um, but this is much more connected with optimal control than reinforcement learning really. Okay, so I'm coming to the, uh, to the end here. Uh, you know, basically we need to be able to get self-supervised learning to work so that we can uh, get machines to run models of the world. If those models of the world are sophisticated enough, uh, the system might be able to acquire some sort of common sense, you know, similar to what animals and humans are doing, uh, possibly, okay, that's, that's a hope. Uh, I've argued for the fact that the architecture should be a joint embedding uh, predictive architecture, that we should not try to do generative models, it's hopeless. I've argued that we should not use, uh, and because they are joint embedding predictive architectures, they're not probabilistic models. So we have to use the framework of energy-based models. Um, uh, be, uh, because, uh, um, you know, because those models are not uh, uh, predictive, I mean, are not, you know, don't predict the, the variables that they measure dependencies between, uh, you know, they, 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 cannot be, uh, they cannot be probabilistic, essentially. Um, they can be hierarchical because uh, a JEPA learns um, abstract representations in which the prediction is performed. Um, we can stack them and then have more and more abstract predictions. So it's kind of a, you know, a kind of a rehash of the whole idea of deep learning, which is really about learning hierarchical uh, representations of the world. But here is for the purpose of prediction. Um, and then I've argued that we can use energy minimization essentially with respect to actions or something like that as a form of reasoning. So I think a lot of reasoning that we do has to do with simulation, which is really what the world model is doing, and has to do with uh, you know, finding latent variables that can minimize some sort of energy that we are interested in. And so re reasoning really in that form is some, some form of uh, constraint satisfaction really, okay? Finding the minimum of some energy function. I think that explains a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, reasoning, and the nice thing about this is that it makes reasoning basically sort of a differentiable process, right? And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Uh, thank you. Uh, so. Uh,